So today is January 29th. So the first month of the year is almost through. So I want to ask you right now to think of the New Year's resolution you've made for 2019 or the last year. Some of us decided to exercise more often, other to eat healthier. How are you doing? How long did you keep your resolution last year? It's very rare we keep our resolutions through the whole year. The odds are against us since nearly 80% of all resolutions fail by the second week of February, so the failure deadline is really near. Of course, we are all aware of the fact that making a resolution can really have tremendous change in our lives, but have you ever thought that keeping your resolutions can change lives of your family members, including kids and also future generations? Fate of our children depends on our eating habits. Let's make cautious decisions about our diet to keep future generations healthy. So every two seconds, someone aged 30 to 70 years dies prematurely from non-communicable diseases, in short, NCDs. So NCDs are non-infectious diseases that cannot be easily spread from person to person, for example, by germs. <coughs> World Health Organization has estimated that almost 41 million of people are killed by NCDs every year. So this is an equivalent of 71% of all deaths occurring worldwide. So there are, there are four major categories of NCDs, such as cardiovascular diseases, stroke, heart attack, cancer, chronic respiratory diseases, such as asthma, and diabetes. These four types of diseases account for almost 80% of deaths related to NCDs. What is more important, a healthy diet is among five main NCD risks. So it is clear now that patterns of diseases are following the patterns of nutrition in the population. Major killers such as coronary heart disease or stroke are growing in prevalence in all parts of the world as increasing wealth and the global trade change dietary patterns in countries where the population used to subsist on a simpler, freshly made and mainly plant-based diet. Developing countries are really facing much more faster change of the dietary patterns and because of that, faster increase of NCDs incidence for example, rapid economic growth of Southeast Asia decreased the number of undernutrition in children, but on the other hand, increased numbers of overnutrition leading to obesity and overweight. It mainly occurs in urban areas with easy access to processed food, full of unhealthy additives and served in much bigger portions than decades ago. Only 20 years of development of Southeast Asia doubled the number of kids who are obese. The situation is not much different in other countries. In Europe, in average, every third child is overweight or obese, and Polish children are among those gaining weight faster than their peers in other European countries. So no, most frightening is the fact that no matter where the obese or overweight kid lives, he or she is likely to develop <coughs> non-communicable diseases such as cardiovascular disease or diabetes, jeopardizing sustainability of our health system. The numbers are also overwhelming as number of overweight or obese infants were estimated to be in 2016 around 42 million and if the current trend continues, we will reach the number of 70 million in 2025. 
That is why researchers are looking for the connections between the certain foods and nutrients and incidence of certain health problems, especially NCDs. Studies show that almost half of deaths in the United States in 2012 related to NCDs were connected with unhealthy diet, mostly with poor consumption of foods and nutrients widely known to be vital for health and overconsumption of other foods that are not. So how unhealthy diet can be related to drastic increase of NCDs? Epidemiological studies have suggested that adult disease risk is strongly connected with environmental conditions, for example, unhealthy diet experienced during early development in a process known as a nutritional programming. So the powerful example of the strength of the nutritional programming in human population is the Dutch hunger winter. At the turn of 1944-45, widespread starvation was seen in the western city of the Netherlands. And then number studies showed that women who were exposed to famine during pregnancy gave birth to children with certain health problems that have persisted longer in their life, adult lives, for example, obesity or diabetes. What's more, famine silenced centered genes in unborn children that they stayed quiet ever since. And scientists think that those genes were switched off and they are responsible for keeping metabolism on a lower gear. So nutritional programming can really affect different aspects of our lives, but what is more important can affect several generations exposed at once to, for example, unhealthy diet. Using mouse models, we were able to understand how unhealthy diet can be related to passing disease risk over generations in animals and humans. In my lab, we are studying effects of malnutrition on reproductive success. Using mouse model, we were able to show how undernutrition during a specific period, lactation, can have an effect on the programming of a brain part called hypothalamus, defining reproductive success of future generations. So are there ways to stop it? Yes, of course. Fortunately, there are ways to stop this ball rolling over generations. First, we need to change our eating habits. Although many of them were established during childhood, it doesn't mean it's too late to work on them and change them. Change may not be easy and it isn't always fast, but with time and effort, Almost any habit can be reshaped. The MIT researchers identified simple neurological loop at the core of every habit, the loop that consists of a cue, a routine, and a reward. So to understand your habit, you need to identify the elements of your loops. So just start and reflect on your eating habits, those good and bad, and at the beginning, Try to identify the routine, then reward and common cause. Next step is to replace unhealthy routines with healthier ones. You can try to pick diet or dietary habit known to be good for longer and healthier life, such as diets of the populations with extraordinary high longevity labeled recently as a blue zones. For example, a population of Okinawa in Japan, Loma Linda in California, or Sardinia in Italy. What is more important, your effort to change your life will help to build eating habits in your children. They will have a healthier life and they will pass good eating habits to the next generations. It is due to the fact that days are very important and those first days between 
gestation and child's second birthday are crucial for cognitive and physical development of children. What's more, at early years, children develop eating habits that have really immediate and long-term consequences on their weight status and health. Children eat what, when and how much to eat through family and other environmental conditions. And we parents are really crucial in helping kids to develop good eating habits and preferences. A growing number of studies show that parental eating practices can affect children developing unhealthy eating habits, such as, for example, eating excessive amounts, eating in absence of hunger, or even emotional eating that are really increasing risk of obesity and overweight. So we have to care about eating habits we are passing to the next generations. I am a mother, an aunt, and I care, and for sure there are more, more mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, grandparents in the audience who care. We have to remember that the fate of our children depends on our eating habits. I believe that individual effort matters. According to the timeless phrase of President John Kennedy, one person can make a difference and everyone should try. Thank you. <laughs>